Well, about 10 years before Memphis police officers killed T. Ray Nichols, the department altered its yearly in-service training to double the amount of time officers spent in shoot or don't shoot scenario trainings, which promised to teach decision making and restraint. These trainings were designed to decrease shootings by officers and increase the chances that, as a local news station put it, officers can disarm suspects, get them into custody without having to make any life or death decisions. And since then, the department also mandated use of force reporting and de-escalation training, banned chokeholds, authorized body cameras, and implemented a duty to intervene policy, which requires officers to stop their colleagues' excessive force. And the department's slick reimagined policing site now touts its majority Black force, reports on its use of force statistics, and declares that it wants to, quote, listen and do the work to promote the safe and effective delivery of police services. On January 7th of this year, five officers from the elite Scorpion unit of MPD, in full view of their body cams, beat T. Ray Nichols to death. After videos of Nichols' killing were publicized, a mass of public figures called for systemic police reform, including better training. The NAACP Memphis president, Van Turner, for instance, said, quote, we just need to focus back on training. We had a reimagining law enforcement committee, which put forth some of these plans. So I think we just have to implement them to prevent these kinds of tragedies. The Tennessee state representative, Joe Towns Jr., argued, quote, we need to figure out what kind of training is done, what kind of training needs to be done, and if there needs to be some tweaking. So despite increasing challenges to such responses, they remain really a common practice after police killings of Black Americans. Reformers call for training in de-escalation, bystander intervention, communication, community sensitivity, use of force. And where the department in question already has stringent training policies in place, like Memphis PD, commentators insist that such policies must be enforced or perhaps tweaked to finally achieve their goal of mitigating police killings of Black people, even as fatal shootings have crept upward over the last 10 years. So in this talk, I will explore some ethnographic realities of scenario trainings, which are one of the hallmark kinds of trainings proposed in the wake of police killings. I am a cultural anthropologist who primarily works on US police reform. So I critically analyze not what works and what doesn't in terms of reform, but rather how the people involved in policing understand their work, the politics and the logics that underpin modern US policing, and why structurally police reforms so often fail, why we see the same reforms repeated over and over since the 60s. During my field work from 20 police departments in Maryland, I observed scenario exercises in academies, active shooter trainings, and SWAT team practices. U.S. police reformers often point to scenario or reality-based exercises as particularly promising ways to teach judicious uses of force and to suppress officers' fear. And in these reality-based trainings, officers will immersively act out real-life scenarios such as making arrests, de-escalating arguments, or deciding whether to shoot someone. Scenarios may involve real life role playing or virtual reality simulators, and they feature prominently, increasingly prominently, in SWAT team practices and training sites such as police academies. And these scenario trainings promise to allow officers to rehearse reality, aligning their judgment with, with rational thinking rather than fearful impulse. Reformers generally understand scenarios as potential antidotes to officer survival trainings, which supposedly transform officers into these militarized warriors who are hyper, hyper alert to threat with deadly consequences for criminalized communities of color. For instance, the Minneapolis mayor, Jacob Frey, announced in 2019 that the city's police officers were prohibited from attending what he called fear-based warrior style police training. After investigations revealed that Officer Geronimo Yanez had participated in a private training course called the Bulletproof Warrior two years before killing Philando Castile in Minneapolis. This course taught officers how to anticipate and survive combat in a time of purportedly skyrocketing violence against police. Now, it's important to note that in practice, officer survival and scenario trainings actually overlap because the former is a tactical and psychological orientation, while the latter is a form of training. Officer survival trainings can use scenarios, particularly in shoot or don't shoot exercises, 
And even reform-oriented scenario trainings don't necessarily exclude officer safety concerns. But nonetheless, we often see reformers arguing that scenario trainings can decenter a warrior ethos of survivalism in order to minimize officer fear and therefore, they hope, racialized police violence. So as I'll argue today, the realities constructed within these reality-based trainings against the aspirations of reformers shape and reorient officer fear rather than just suppressing it. Fear-based warrior style thinking seemingly leaks into reform-oriented scenario training. Officer safety forecloses all other considerations. And this leakage, I argue, is not merely a failure of effective reform that we can fix by neutralizing fear with stronger doses of reality. And instead, I think it demonstrates how at the heart of modern US policing is what I call police common sense, which is a way of apprehending the world that transforms anti-Black police violence into a mere technical concern and centers officer safety above everything else. Scenario trainings recruit police into police common sense by materializing threat, bringing it into a kind of material reality, and by rendering the violence that is supposedly required to face it a matter of practical, colorblind common sense. Police common sense holds threat as potentially coming from anybody even though its mandates for controlling threat rest on anti-Black ideas. And by inculcating police common sense, scenario trainings epitomize how U.S. policing absorbs and translates reform. Police common sense prevents scenario training reforms from achieving their desired impact by producing a commonsensical and irrefutable version of the world, which naturalizes certain forms of police violence and even actually makes it inevitable. And in this talk, I'm gonna make this case by exploring how scenario trainings work in practice, how they teach officers to be prepared, how they foreclose alternate futures, and how they emphasize the primacy of officer safety. And my point here is not to offer alternative policy proposals, but rather to challenge the pervasive thinking on existing proposals that get recycled with every new crisis in police legitimacy. So I start by explaining what I mean by police common sense, then exploring how scenario trainings calibrate fear by producing a colorblind, commonsensical, tactical awareness. Then I'll look at how officers learn to inhabit command presence, which teaches officers how to embody both the authority of the state and physical human vulnerability in order to control the people that they police. And then I'll examine virtual reality scenario trainings, which often get praised for their potential to produce better uses of force. And I'll suggest that rather than undoing police fear, virtual reality actually justifies it by materializing and making real a certainty that threat could exist. And finally, I'll discuss the stakes of these arguments for reform efforts, arguing that they immunize policing against substantive reform. So I define common sense, just to start, police common sense, as a collectively shared practical approach to the tensions of embodying both, as I said, state authority and a sense of vulnerability. And here I'm borrowing from scholar Antonio Gramsci, who writes about common sense as a set of pragmatic received wisdoms, which are not necessarily thought through, but rather just accepted as natural. And Scholars Stuart Hall and Alan O'Shea argue, quote, the virtue of common sense is that it is obvious. Its watchword is, of course, it seems to be outside time. And an important facet of common sense is that it stitches together mutually contradictory elements without resolving their tensions. And one example Hall and O'Shea give of this is the contradictions between two ideas that we often take as common sense in the U.S., on the one hand, Judeo-Christian ideals of love thy neighbor as thyself, and on the other, a capitalist ideal of self-interested competition that leaves losers in the dust. And I take these ideas to help me understand police common sense and specifically the way officers are taught to think about their own safety. Within police common sense, officer safety is the foundation of police work. All other considerations, almost all of the time, must be subsumed to officer safety considerations, and this is more or less taken for granted and thought of as timeless, even though, interestingly, the officer safety movement, as it's often called, has really only been around in one form or another since the 1970s. 
And moreover, police common sense contains stories that seem to contradict one another. Officers are rightful holders of ultimate authority. Officers are vulnerable. Threat is colorblind. Threat is the unruly black body. And I'm not trying to argue the tenets of police common sense on practical grounds here. For instance, how safe policing really is or what threats to police really are, but rather offer a deconstruction of how it works in practice. Quote, I'm not trying to set you up to think you'll get killed on every call or to make you paranoid, a SWAT team officer told a class of recruits. Call the way you would a barking dog call, but also can anything happen? Yes. On a sunny spring morning, SWAT team members were leading a module on basic tactical maneuvers. Nearby, the Baltimore Police Department was laboring under a consent decree, a reform agreement with the Department of Justice, and departments nationally were talking the language of reform. And even in departments like this one, which enjoyed a clean reputation with its majority white population, academy training had self-consciously shifted to signal its commitment to a guardian mindset. Recruits wrote personal mission statements and learned about trauma-informed care. But nonetheless, at the indisputable core of this academy teaching was the common sense mantra that officer safety comes first. Tactical maneuvers training began inside a classroom adorned with posters proclaiming catchphrases like, you can never have enough bullets, then moved outside for scenario exercises. Recruits learned how to approach buildings, move through rooms, and consider angles from which someone could shoot them. Quote, you ha always have to be aware, set yourself up in case it breaks bad, the SWAT officer explained. It'll be 1% of calls, but you have to always be thinking tactically. Tactical thinking meant that one must play the what if game, he said, even in the least threatening situations. What if someone ambushes me from that shed during a noise complaint call? What if I arrive at a mental health check and someone walks out waving a shovel? Where will I stand, run, hide, aim? And from their first week in academy, these recruits had already been indoctrinated into prioritizing officer safety. They were initially instructed to stand against the wall like these recruits when waiting in the hallway outside their classroom and to not make eye contact with passersby. And then gradually they were taught to scan people up and down without saying a word. Finally, they were allowed to greet passersby with good morning, sir or ma'am. The point was that they should, quote, think threat first, their supervisor told me. They should learn to see everyone as potential threats and size them up quickly and then acknowledge their presence. This layering of concerns of personal security before politeness points to the heart of police common sense. A readiness mindset should naturally be one's primary mandate. Furthermore, this awareness should theoretically not be tied to race and gender because anybody could threaten. The SWAT team members attempted to translate this mindset into the practicality of police common sense. Never turn your back on any potential threat, they instructed recruits. When approaching a house, always glance into parked cars to make sure nobody's there. Think threat first, then layer on your communications, your mental health training, your de-escalation. Training officers frequently emphasize that thinking threat should mostly remain undetected, present only in recruits' minds. Only in that 1% of cases will they need to manifest their calculations and take action in the world. You should treat every inmate like they're about to escape, a corrections officer told the recruits in a later academy module. Like you treat every person like they might have the worst disease, like you treat every call like anything could happen. You don't necessarily act on it, but you have it in your head. So it's not that everyone is a threat, it's that anyone could be, and therefore officers must continually envision how to mitigate that threat. One officer referred to the proper threat preparedness mindset as the duck analogy. Quote, the duck looks graceful as shit, but underneath is paddling hard. One never sees the feet. This distinction between awareness and action was tactically important for many trainers, because if officers were to see actual threat rather than its possibility everywhere, their constant fear could incapacitate their decision-making capacity with dire results. For one, this could produce impulsive reactions and therefore departmental liability. Quote, someone holding a cell phone in the dark and you getting too close and getting scared is how cops mess up and shoot unarmed people, a SWAT officer told recruits in a nod to any number of killings as they practiced an overdose call. 
Fearful reactive officers might also become visibly anxious, which trainings, trainers explained can undermine police authority. As a training supervisor counseled recruits, quote, and sorry, there's a lot of cursing in these quotes. Um, the biggest thing is don't come in tense. Not everyone's out to kill you. Be aware, but relax. There's a big difference between being nervous and being aware. If you're nervous, shit bags are going to see it, end quote. So the ideal mode of thinking threat in short remains silent and produces a kind of preparedness that's indiscernible to the public eye. Beneath the surface, officers should be watching their angles, scanning for observation points, and paddling like hell. Scenario trainings then channel police fear into the common sense of tactical awareness. Thinking threat does not translate straightforwardly to trigger happy as it's often sort of conceived, but rather to a confident, calm mindset of preparedness. And it's important to note that trainings actually encouraged restraint where possible and emphasized tailoring force to context, framing officers as professional violence experts. The threat these experts would face was presented as anonymous, a free floating notion detached from racialized bodies, thereby skirting charges of racism while preparing officers for threat understood as simultaneously everywhere and anywhere. Furthermore, scenarios conception of threat as potentially ubiquitous or ubiquitously potential helped produce a common sense vision of officers as vulnerable. If one's own body is killable at anyone's hands, if anything can happen, then thinking threat first was simply a natural response. Scenario training teaches officers how to navigate this vulnerability by tying survival to embodying authority. Such training, as I will argue, displays the racial imagination simmering under these supposedly colorblind mandates to think threat. It also reveals the contradictions within police common sense. For police, all situations involving officers are understood to be safer for everyone when the officer maintains control, with anarchy threatening those who don't. Recruits learn that their elementary tool for exercising control is command presence, or the unspoken language of authority, which ideally manifests police dominance and professionalism in the form of demeanor, tone, and attire. It thereby signals that the officer is in charge and not to be questioned. Police often view this display of strength as a kind of de-escalation tactic. If officers project their authority, civilians will be less likely to challenge or attack them. Trainers therefore work to imbue underconfident re recruits with an ability to command. During one academy module that I saw, recruits were funneled through a series of multi-person role play scenario exercises designed to test their command presence. Other officers from the agency played the role of civilians in various scenarios while academy instructors observed. In one exercise, two volunteer officers sat in a parked car while one recruit at a time play acted performing a routine traffic stop. The instructor told the volunteers who were playing civilians that when the recruit begins the stop, quote, jump out and act like a flaming asshole. If they bring good strong command presence and show they're in charge, then you calm down and get back in the car. If they're acting all shy and sheepish like yesterday and don't put on their big boy pants, then you escalate, end quote. Recruits who managed to subdue the unruly civilians did so by insisting loudly that they get back in the car, while those who struggled to assert dominance had to face mimed shootouts. And this exercise concretized for recruits the link between a failure to project authority and inevitable violence. Like policing itself, command presence hinges on ideals of heteromasculinity or just manliness, stereotypically requiring a booming voice and imposing stature. Those whose bodies deviate from the prototypical large man are considered more vulnerable to disrespect and attack. So in order to maintain officer safety, they have to mimic or even exceed supposedly masculine traits. For instance, one academy class I observed had a short woman recruit who I'll call Michelle, who often hesitated in scenario exercises and spoke politely when she was meant to be aggressive. Her instructors frequently complained out of earshot that she was shy and nervous, traits which were unbefitting an officer. However, when Michelle did act with confidence, they praised her effusively. During one exercise that required recruits to catch, search, and maintain control of a volunteer who was fleeing from them, Michelle grabbed the volunteer, quote, like she owned him, her instructor gushed. He told her afterward that, quote, 
You may have to take your authority up a notch as both a small female and a new cop. You'll be challenged, so you may have to escalate more quickly. So here, trainers translated a practical recognition of how authority operates socially. Recruits like Michelle could not display authority as legibly as large men into the expectation that their safety would require escalated force. In order to command the obedience required for officer safety, recruits had to cultivate a convincingly dominant masculine demeanor and resort to violence if that demeanor failed to produce the proper compliance. Such command presence exercises also highlighted who was imagined as the main targets of control. For instance, the largely white volunteer officers playing civilians often jokingly mimicked black complaints of police. Quote, fuck you, why'd you stop me? Is it the color of my skin? One role-playing white officer asked a white recruit attempting to make a traffic stop. During another exercise, the instructor distinguished the level of command presence they considered necessary in Greenville, the poorer blacker district, from what was required in the wealthier whiter Springfield. He explained, quote, maybe it's different in Springfield, but in Greenville, they'll walk all over you. You have to maintain control. Poor Black residents were implicitly understood as adversarial threats to that control. An image which was confirmed during a difficult scenario I witnessed, a noise complaint call where a crowd of 10 volunteers pretended to be holding a party. Be mouthy, the instructor told volunteers before recruits arrived. You've all been in Greenville. While recruits performed the exercise, the volunteers ignored them, comically taunted them, and imitated the discourses of hyper-policed Black communities. So here, command presence clearly had an object, unruly and uncooperative Black civilians. Officers who were otherwise concerned not to appear racist took few pains to hide from me this common sense understanding, which was shared by many interlocutors across different agencies. Black civilians were portrayed as more likely to act disorderly, to resist arrest, and to otherwise merit aggressive attempts at control, a belief that these officers often articulated as simply realistic and therefore not about race. This understanding of noncompliance was simply the tip of anti-Black contempt and dehumanization. Officers marked poor Black neighborhoods as, quote, problem areas or shitholes, a few officers noted casually that they could do more in poor Black areas, get away with more violations, under the banner of suppressing crime and asserting authority. A retired Black officer and reform advocate who I spoke to criticized officers who, de who deploy more violent and invasive tactics in Black neighborhoods, whereas, as he told me, quote, they can't abuse white people, they know that too, you'll lose your job quick. Scholars, Black liberation movements, and residents of hyper-police neighborhoods have made and lived this argument for generations. As scholar Robin D.G. Kelly argues, members of poor Black communities, quote, targeted by the state are not considered rights-bearing individuals to be protected, but criminals poised to violate the law who thus require vigilant watch, not unlike prisoners. The concept of command presence has historically received criticism for facilitating the criminalization of Blackness. For instance, the Christopher Commission's 1991 evaluation of the Los Angeles Police Department's use of excessive force linked command presence to needless confrontations. However, it's also important to note that long before command presence materializes as physical violence, it envisions and inculcates through common sense a racialized object of control, the quote-unquote thug poised to attack the weak and unimposing who understands only the language of dominance. Scenario trainings transform the human material of the police recruit into a physical embodiment of state power, fostering a demeanor that's designed to convey indisputable authority in order to control policed people, particularly people of color and the poor. At the same time, trainings fundamentally acknowledge the tenuousness of that authority and they pivot around protecting the officer's own vulnerability. Command presence scenario trainings therefore illuminate the tension of holding police power in one's body. On the one hand, the notion that control and authority naturally belong to police as wearers of the badge and agents of the state is considered commonsensical, not just by police themselves, but by many of us. On the other, that control is understood less as a moral imperative of enforcing allegiance to the law 
and more as a necessity for officer survival, for the survival of the threatened human body representing governmental authority. Scenario trainings teach that body how to envision and defend its vulnerability by asserting heteromasculine dominance, particularly over poor Black civilians. Now, the core mandates of role play scenarios that I've been talking about, thinking threat first, navigating authority and vulnerability, all within this nominally colorblind frame, reach their peak in virtual reality or VR simulators. VR scenarios starkly highlight the ways that police common sense is actually seductive. As Black-led movements against US police violence peaked in public attention in 2014 to 2016, VR simulators received favorable media coverage for their promise to immersively and accurately mimic police worlds and to thereby help trainees suppress fear, minimize uses of force, and develop better judgment under realistically stressful conditions. VR platforms by companies like Axon, Vertra, and Apex, Off Apex Officer claim to provide a simulated realism too expensive or difficult for in-person role play to emulate using professional actors or photorealistic graphics. Using VR headsets or videos projected onto walls or panels, simulators play pre-programmed scenarios in which characters react automatically to the officer's actions, like by dropping to the ground when shot in the head or screaming when shot in the arm, or in some programs can actually be directed by the simulator's operator to respond appropriately. For instance, if an officer gives a convincing verbal command, the operator can select an option for man gets on his knees rather than man gets hostile. And whereas VR claims to offer technical solutions to both perceived gaps in police training and the broader issues of racialized violence, I argue that VR scenarios instead naturalize and justify that violence by powerfully materializing the idea of threat to their lives as omnipresent. VR scenarios do lack the tactile experience of in-person role play, but they nonetheless offer a, a unique brand of realism within which, as I discovered in my own introduction to one agency simulator, police common sense prefigures the response that is considered reasonable. So in the center of a simulator like this one, the room darkened, I stood empty handed next to my officer interlocutor. A training instructor switched on the program and projected onto the walls a wraparound image of the lobby of a police station, the very station in which we stood. Explaining that the software allowed them to insert their own photographs, he watched with us as actors on screen moved realistically against the backdrop of the lobby, playing employees and visitors. The instructor then demonstrated various scenarios in which a shooter attacks the police station, strolling into the lobby and opening fire, popping out from a hallway, ambushing officers in the parking lot. Such scenarios, the instructor said, aim to inculcate constant vigilance. He demonstrated with another one in the scenario's parking lot. The scene opens on a woman lying on the pavement, groaning and clutching her bloody stomach. A little girl stands nearby, looking unruffled, apparently playing with a phone. Suddenly, the phone is a gun and she shoots at you. The captain explained that if you shoot back and then try to render aid, another woman may leap out from behind the car and fire at you as well. In the world imagined by these station scenarios, threat lurks in the shadows of your own workplace. A shooter stalks the familiar hallways, mowing down innocents until stopped. Actors play your colleagues, dying on the floors you may cross dozens of times a day. Most other scenarios that I later observed use the software's inbuilt backgrounds, but the shooting at the station scenarios, I think, illuminated an important facet of officer survival thinking. They invited officers to viscerally inhabit their own environment as potentially under siege. At any point, things could go south and you need to be prepared, was the logic. The little girl scenario also invoked the unpredictability of sudden violence, while leaving unaddressed the absurdity of a small child shooting a woman in a police department parking lot. What mattered was not understanding the girl's motives, but rather calculating for and defending against even remote dangers. So in other words, not reason, but survival. This scenario hammered home the message that probabilities mattered less than possibilities. If it could happen, no matter how unlikely, it must be prepared for. 
This message was repeated over and over in a multi-hour VR scenario training I observed at an academy. Recruits enter the darkened simulator in ones and twos, armed with training guns and deactivated tasers while their classmates watched. Their instructor, Adam, ran recruits through various scenarios, each oriented around a clear lesson. Not all of them were deadly, but all sought to inculcate police common sense. In one scenario, you must kill a white woman's dog or risk it attacking you or a playground full of children. In another, you shoot a white man who draws a gun during a traffic stop. Quote, there's no such thing as a low risk traffic stop, Adam reminded the recruits. After you shot him, what do you do first? The recruits, uncertain, stumbled over their answers. Render aid? No, he could have another gun, Adam said. You maintain lethal coverage, which means keep a weapon aimed at him, then search him, then render aid. So here, the police logic at th of threat operated at odds with notions of care, which had to be drummed out of the recruits. They had to learn to think threat first. Unlike in role play scenarios, however, if you chose to first help someone you just shot, the simulator could actually punish your decency with terrifying realism. Perhaps the wounded driver will whip out a second gun as you try to stanch his bleeding. Perhaps, as in the little girl scenario, someone else will spring out to put a bullet through your head. While simulators can also be used for trainings on subjects such as implicit bias and bystander intervention, in public demonstrations, they're often used for shoot or don't shoot scenarios to stress the practicality of police common sense. In a 2014 special called Cops Under Fire, for instance, CNN's Don Lemon played his studio audience a shoot or don't shoot scenario video, simulator video, excuse me, which emphasized that refusing to abide by police pragmatism inevitably produces worse violence. In this scenario, a domestic violence scene between a white couple, a man screams and curses at a woman, his face contorted as he shoves her against a wall. Lemon paused the video with the man's right hand out of sight. How many of you would shoot, he asked. Few of the mostly Black audience members polled said they would, aside from an attorney for Darren Wilson, the former police officer who killed Michael Brown, who was inexplicably in the audience. Wilson's attorney sagely explained that the man will harm you or the woman, so not only can you legally shoot him, but perhaps you should. Lemon then played out the video, revealing that the man indeed is holding a gun, which he turns on the woman and then on you. Lemon chided his audience, quote, the woman ends up dead, the officer could end up dead, and the suspect ends up dead as well, right? My own experience in the simulator similarly revealed the ideological seduction of virtual training. Throughout my field work, officers labored to conscript me into police common sense, telling me, for instance, that they hoped trainings opened my eyes to the law enforcement profession and by implication, the reasonableness of their thinking. VR scenarios offered a powerful way for them to demonstrate to me the utter futility of resisting police common sense. During a break between recruit groups, Adam handed me a training gun and played a scenario that opens with a call for a fired Black employee who's refusing to leave his employer's premises. The employee sits in his pickup truck outside a building as his boss pleads through the truck window for him to leave. Suddenly, the boss yells he's got a gun and rushes back inside. Adam paused the scene to ask what I would do. I guess look for cover and talk to him, I said, fumbling for the most peaceful option. So talk to him, Adam said. Mimicking the language I had heard in trainings, I began repeating, hey man, come out and talk to me. It doesn't have to be like this. The man slowly emerges from his pickup, holding a gun to his temple, and walks toward the building. I watched helplessly as he enters. Then with several shots and screaming, the scenario ends. Did it make you think, Adam asked. What did you just allow to happen? You allowed someone who's just been fired to go back into his workplace and kill people. Could you justify shooting him before he got there? Yes, you had to shoot him. Adam could have chosen a de-escalatory option once I began talking to the character, but he aimed to prove that from the moment the man stepped out with a gun, you could rightfully kill him. Whether in another world, in another programmed decision point, he could have dropped the gun, that was immaterial. What was material was the single branching path that led the man to commit mass murder, 
to threaten your safety and the safety of innocent civilians. That path foreclosed all the others. Such scenarios redolent of American realities of mass shootings, statistically unlikely for any individual department to encounter, yet ubiquitous nationwide, with the archetypally white mass shooter played by a black man, are both real and unreal. Others make real the fear of a, depart of a gunman stalking your precinct's halls, a second shooter, a phone that is a gun. If in real life someone holding a gun may not necessarily shoot at an officer in the simulator, they almost certainly will. And can you afford to wait and see what did you just allow to happen? Whether or not the threat materializes is almost a moot point. In Don Lemon's paused scenario, for instance, the abusive man's out-of-sight hand exists in a state of uncertainty, a paradox of simultaneously deadly and non-deadly violence. Once observed, the hand collapses into one or the other as it's revealed to hold a gun or be balled into a fist. Yet the uncertainty at the moment of decision-making generates its own form of certainty, that the scenario contains the possibility of a gun. And the point I'm making here is not that the gun is never there, or of course that mass shootings are non-existent. It's that scenarios do not simply suppress fear as reformers hope, but rather reorient it around a logic of preparedness that gets enclosed in the immediacy of the present. These survivalist lessons unfold in their own grammar, their own mood. Threat assessments primarily function not in the simple past tense, what did in reality happen, nor even in the future-oriented calculus of what was likely to happen. Instead, they operate in the subjunctive mood, what might be, what could have been. In the simulator, the many logical potential outcomes of a situation are eclipsed by the subjunctive certainty that threat could exist in this very moment. This foreclosure, in turn, induces a radical presentism. If you do not somehow stop the fired employee right now, he could kill you or his co-workers, he will kill you or his co-workers, and rent a stop threat and live. So when Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd in 2020, many writers and activists pointed out that the Minneapolis Police Department had been considered a model of progressive reform. The department offered numerous trainings on reformers' wish lists, including scenarios. Yet such training did not stop Chauvin from murdering Floyd. Moreover, Chauvin himself was a field training officer responsible for guiding new officers in the field, as was Kimberly Potter, the Minneapolis officer who killed 20-year-old Dante Wright as Chauvin's trial unfolded in April 2021. Similarly, the Nashville Police Department already mandated, excuse me, Memphis Police Department already mandated use of force reporting and de-escalation training banned chokeholds, authorized body cameras, and implemented a duty to intervene policy, requiring officers to stop their colleagues' excessive force when five officers beat T. Ray Nichols to death in full view of their body cameras. Since George Floyd's murder, abolitionist ideas drawing on the longstanding work of Black feminist thinkers like Angela Davis, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, and Miriam Kaba have gained broad circulation among a public increasingly disillusioned with the promises of reform. Growing numbers of organizers, progressive politicians, and even some police themselves have advocated for investing more in housing, health care, and other services, and for shifting certain duties away from police. Police reformers, however, continue to turn to training, framing it as a vital antidote to police violence. Absent from the reformist assumption that training can be improved is often the question of how trainings work in practice not only how they might be imperfect at preventing future Chauvin's or Potter's, but how even the most promising training reforms reproduce and intensify racialized violence. As protests continue and reform bills pass into state and national legislatures, as cities like Atlanta shovel millions into new police training facilities and arrest and even kill protesters, the stakes of grasping how trainings work have rarely been higher. So just to wrap up, Working with officers demonstrated to me why police common sense is ideologically persuasive beyond reductive narratives of fear. Police common sense provides officers a framework for negotiating the tensions of embodying state power and a very deliberately structured human vulnerability. 
It's so apparently timeless and self-justifying that even its critics often leave speaking in its terms. Finally, it helps forge a sealed worldview that blocks all other logics. At the end of the day, officer safety comes first. In this sense, then, police common sense ultimately translates training reforms into police terms. Any effort to improve US police through training is filtered through its logics of officer safety. These logics help absorb and tame critiques of the policing institution, thereby rendering it impervious to substantive change. As most of my interlocutors would likely agree, scenario trainings designed to suppress fear cannot alter the presupposition that fear for one's life justifies violence, even when the gun is just a phone, and in fact, they help naturalize that violence. Reality-based trainings cannot change the deeply ingrained notion that officers must be prepared for inevitable threat. And in fact, they frame that threat in intimately imagined detail. Training reforms may reinforce police legitimacy and serve as rationales to siphon more public funds into police departments, but they do not remake and indeed often strengthen the centrality of officer survival. Thus, attempts to reckon with the violence of police training run aground on the unassailable shoals, the seductive inevitability of police common sense. Thank you, and uh, I look forward to any questions, feedback, and thoughts that uh, folks have. Yeah, so if you have a question, we can, oh, there we go. Uh, there's wonderful talk. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, you can ask either in the chat or uh, with your raise hand function in the reaction tab, which looks like that little hand in the, uh, or you can wave in the video. If you like. Yeah. So it looks like maybe, well, I know, um, I guess the, the question that I would have, and just to get it kind of on record is, I know you said at the beginning that you didn't necessarily want to talk about the the actual versus perceived threat, but there are statistics out there on that, right? And Absolutely. Maybe, maybe you could talk about where we could find that, or if you've looked into it a little bit more, just kind of as an anecdote, because I think the initial uh, criticism or the question that would pop up immediately is, well, aren't police justified in thinking that everything is a threat? Right, absolutely. Yeah, thank you for asking that. I was just looking, I'm really bad at recalling names, but um, I do have some articles which I'd be happy to share if folks are interested. Um, I'm thinking of one by someone whose name I'm blanking on um, about uh, police, uh, Sierra, Sierra Arevolo um, is his last name, um, uh, about uh, police danger narratives, the ways that um, officers are, you know, like I was talking about here, officers are taught that their jobs are incredibly dangerous. And um, this article and other articles look at um, uh, traffic stops, for instance, like police are often told, as I referenced, that um, traffic stops are among actually the most dangerous things you can do as an officer, because you never know what you'll encounter, you're stuck on the side of the road by yourself. Um, but these, this research finds that in reality, um, uh, the statistics are very, very low. I'm also terrible at recalling numbers, so that's not helping me here, but that basically these um, traffic stops are nowhere near as dangerous as officers think that they are. Here we go. Michael Sierra Arevolo, American Policing and the Danger, um, and the danger Imperative. Um, and there are other, you know, there's other research that shows that um, policing uh, is certainly a more a dangerous job in terms of fatalities and injuries than, you know, most forms of office work, for instance, but it doesn't even crack the top 10 in terms of the most dangerous occupations in the U.S. Those are, you know, things like um, uh, um, uh, fishing, construction, like that kind of work, um, much more dangerous. And then the last thing I'll add is that um, officers are also specifically taught that, like, the the central piece of officer safety is avoiding being a victim of interpersonal violence. And officers are, especially since 2016, taught to focus on the danger of an ambush. Um, and uh, in fact, I sat through one academy class um, within these officers. First week of the class, they were taught that ambushes are um, the biggest threat that they will face. Um, and, and these, you know, the, the training officers hit this home by showing all these training videos um, of 
other officers across the country who had been the victims of ambush in order to teach these recruits how to not be victims. And I approached the training officer afterward to ask if that was true, um, that, that ambushes were actually the most dangerous. Um, and he said, no, of course not. Um, but it's something that they really need to look out for. In reality, things like, um, you know, vehicular accidents and uh, speeding and all of that are among the most dangerous things that police face. And then, of course, there's COVID since the pandemic, there's um, all of that. So that's one thing that um, the the statistics on officer safety, um, fatalities and, and injuries um, uh, include those kinds of injuries and fatalities. It's not necessarily interpersonal violence.